Communication and Decision Making Communication in some form is a requirement of every society and it is almost universal that each animal species possess the ability to communicate in some recognizable form to other members of the group and often to members of other groups. For example, it seems now that different species of dolphins have different languages, all quite highly evolved, but there is a degree of common understanding between the different species. Communication is not confined to vocal means, but will in any event have a series of conventions and patterns which make it recognizable and above all repeatable. In our modern society, the means of communication are developing at an amazing rate and becoming an ever more complex subject. The technology of communication is not our subject here. We will examine some rather less advanced concepts than email, internet, and satellite communications. We will consider basic communication on a person-to-person -person level. Communication on this level is being somewhat degraded by the electronic revolution. In our society language is the currency which enables most communication. This of course is complicated on a global scale by the vast number of languages and dialects that exist in different tribes. They also have different conventions for communicating. However, without language and the communication that it permits within its subscribing membership, there would be no exchange of ideas or information and society could not function. In our particular business, we rely heavily on communication in various forms. Without it, we, as a mini society, could not function as we currently do. Almost everything we do involves communication of some sort, talking to ATC, reading and responding to checklists, passenger messages, crew briefings, and filling in the tech log, or flight report, talking to ops, or crewing on the phone, all of these are communication. They all contain the same elements, a sender, a message, a receiver, and feedback. There are two primary mediums for communication, oral and visual. Various paths exist for the transmission of information by both these means. However it is achieved, to be effective communication must be a two-way process. A verbal message is pointless if it goes unheard. If it goes unacknowledged it will be a cause for concern, was it heard? Was it understood? Was it misunderstood? This is why feedback is so important. It provides a form of quality control over a transmitted message. If the message is received and understood then no further action is necessary, but the feedback may be a request for more information. This is, perhaps, because the initial message was in some way incomplete or misunderstood. If a colleague tells you something, then they are attempting to communicate with you, however, if you do not hear what is said or are not receptive in some way then that attempted communication will have failed. The two of you have not communicated although one has tried. Failure to respond to a verbal message will probably cause a repetition, but louder. The sender of a written message, for example a company memo or notum, has only communicated with those who read it, not just those who received it, if some of the intended recipients do not receive or read it, then it has failed to reach a part of its audience. In this case, the sender may not know if the message reaches its intended target, as any feedback will inevitably be delayed by such remote communication. In reality, there is often no feedback built into such communications and as such they are suspect as a reliable means of transmitting important information. A first-rate example of feedback is the repeating of ATC clearances. The controller gives you a clearance and by repeating it back to him, he is made immediately aware that you have correctly received and understood the clearance. If the readback is incorrect or incomplete then the controller can repeat the clearance in order to ensure full understanding and compliance. To summarize, feedback provides closure on a communication. The feedback may be one of the following. Message correctly received, no action needed. Message received but not understood fully, clarify. Message received and request more information, provide if possible. Message received in part, repeat missing part. Message not received, wake up. Poor communication on the flight deck, with ATC, cabin crew, company, or passengers is a common cause of misunderstanding and conflict. Remember that this works both ways, and has been responsible either directly or indirectly for many accidents and even more incidents. As the commander of the airplane, it follows that you must be as good as you can be at communicating and encouraging others to strive in a similar fashion. Some people are seemingly born as natural communicators, others struggle to achieve much more than a grunt or a shrug of the shoulders. The majority of us manage well enough, but with a little thought and some application, we can do a whole lot better. The primary requirement is to be aware of why you are communicating and who with. This will enable you to make your communication appropriate for the circumstances. Messages need to be tailored to the needs of the receiver. Being the best you can at communicating will take a little effort initially, but with practice will become second nature. 
It will pay handsome dividends in that you will be less likely to be misunderstood and will have the esteem of your colleagues and crew. Some considerations. You are all members of one crew on the same airplane, good communication throughout the crew is essential to a smooth running operation. As captain, you must set the right example. To be effective, communication must be precise and concise, and it must be relevant and given at an appropriate time. Remember that a two-pilot airplane is just that, not two pilots taking turns flying solo. Keep the cross-cockpit communication lines open at all times. The style of your verbal delivery. A poorly delivered message may be disregarded in spite of being factually correct. Vocal style. Rate of speech delivery, too fast can sound a bit panicky, too slow will put them to sleep. Tone of voice, whether baritone, contralto, or soprano you have to do the best with what you have. We can't all sound like Lawrence Olivier or Richard Burton. National slash regional accent versus BBC English. Let's face it, most of us have some sort of accent and will have a certain amount of dialect in our speech. This will have been influenced by a host of factors such as where you were born and brought up as a child, who your parents were, where you went to school, and which parts of the world you have lived in since then. As a result, your accent and colloquialisms will represent a compendium of your life thus far. These vocal traits will be known and understood by those who know you well, but remember that we have a lot of unique meetings in our job. These are one-off contacts with individuals from equally diverse backgrounds and their understanding of what may be clear to you may be less than perfect, and of course vice versa. Do remember also that aviation is a very international business and many of those we communicate with do not speak English as a first language and will find difficulty with some colloquialisms. At the very least they are likely to lose something in the translation. In these circumstances slowing down your delivery rate may help the other guy, speak slowly enough to be understood without sounding like a demented tourist. Also, speak clearly and use simple words. In face-to-face -face situations carefully watching the other person's reactions to what you say will provide an early warning that understanding may not be taking place. Do not make the assumption that just because you have told someone something they understand you. A useful method of analyzing your verbal style is to tape record your own voice. Quite apart from the inevitable cringe factor, it can be quite revealing about your style of speech and may help you to improve your delivery. The chances are you won't recognize that disembodied, hesitant, mumbling monotone is yours. Listening. In communicating we now know that listening is as important as speaking. It has been said that you'll never learn anything with your mouth open. A bit of an overstatement, after all if you don't ask questions how do you find out that what you need to know? Having said that you will probably spend more time listening to incoming than you will spend on outgoing. Listening is easy, isn't it? It just happens, doesn't it? No, it's not really quite that easy, to listen well you must pay attention. You must pay attention to the meaning and listen to the feeling and emotion being put into the words. The problem is most of us listen passively and only change up a gear to listening actively when we really want to hear something. How many times have you listened to a briefing only to realize later that you didn't take any of it in? By listening passively we listen only to a fraction of what is said and may miss something important. Whether we want to hear it or not is entirely another matter. Consider sitting at a table in a restaurant, you can hear the background buzz all around you can't you? No, you can't because it's just that, background noise, it gets filtered out. But just wait until someone a couple of tables away mentions something you have an interest in, your ears will prick up and you will strain to listen to that conversation through the hubbub of all the buzz. This is the difference between Passive and active listening. Real active listening is a skill that must be learned and practiced. Beware that over concentration on listening can lead to listening only to the words and not the message. In the same way that a secretary taking shorthand dictation is interested only in capturing on paper the words that are spoken, to her the message is irrelevant. Active listening should be conducted in a relaxed fashion and not with the air of an inquisitor. Speaking plus listening equals communicating. When we communicate we are trying to establish an idea in someone else's mind, our aim is to get them to visualize exactly what we have in our mind at the time we transmit the idea. If the idea is a simple one then the task is not too difficult, particularly if the other party already has some knowledge of the subject. 1. We must be aware of how we create our mental picture by careful use of words to describe what we see. 2. We should also be careful to transmit this gem at a time when the recipient is able to receive, in other words when they are likely to be able to actively listen. If they are busy doing something else there is a good chance that your communication may be lost in the background noise of their passive listening. 3. If the mental picture to be transmitted is more complex than the same rules of transmission apply, 
but you are going to have to break the picture down into smaller and more easily understood frames. It's a bit like painting by numbers, the picture appears gradually. When doing this, start from a known point and define where you are starting your explanation from. If you miss out on that stage or you don't build your mind's picture up in a logical sequence then you will get into a muddle and not be understood. 4. Beware also of making assumptions about what someone else might, or might not, know. If you have to communicate in this piecemeal fashion, then ensure that each piece is acknowledged and understood, feedback. 5. Allow the recipient adequate time to assemble each piece of the picture and fit it in with the deliveries already made. As captain, you must be open to all-round communication. This means facilitating those who wish to communicate with you or other members of your crew. Try not to shut people out, particularly by the use of closed statements or negative remarks, and don't talk at them. You are the one who sets the example to your crew and to others, so do make it a good example. Communication and Decision Making the vicious circle. There is an interaction between information transmitted and subsequently received, communication, and decision-making, and any consequent information given in return, communication. Communicating as already said, is a two-way process. Information is exchanged, and your communication with others provides them with information that is used to make their decisions. In return, based on the decisions they have made or actions taken, as a result of your communication to them, they will communicate information to you. If your initial communication was incorrect or incomplete then the return information will also be awry and incorrect actions may already have been enacted. In a nutshell rubbish in equals rubbish out. Good communication and decision making can be seen to be, in simple terms, a part of a never-ending information loop and as such become inseparable. Good communication does not prevent bad decisions but does make them less likely. Certainly, it enables good decisions to be made by making the correct information available. Bad communication however will hamper the process of decision making and may so obscure the facts that a correct answer to a problem is unachievable. If you find yourself qualifying a statement with you know what I mean, then you are not really happy with the transmission you just made. This means that the other party, or parties, has to guess what you really meant. This is not a satisfactory situation, especially on the flight deck. 1. Being certain that you say what you mean is important to enable others to understand you, particularly in times of stress, for example, emergency situations. 2. Being certain that you mean what you say is important for sincerity's sake. 3. If the information you pass to others is duff, then they will make duff decisions, and in return pass you duff information about what is happening. 4. Remember rubbish in equals rubbish out. Definitions. Communication, the giving or imparting of information or a message. Decision, to make a judgment or to come to a conclusion. Decision making, the means by which a judgment is made, and to prejudge an event is often to make an incorrect decision, one made without all the facts. This may be due to the necessary information being unavailable, which could be the result of poor or non-existent communication that masks available information or perhaps distorts or misrepresents it in some way. In conclusion, to assist with the decision-making process there are a number of tools in the form of acronyms that can be used to help you make decision-making a conscious process. One of them is .r. Diagnose. Make a diagnosis. Utilize all available resources and view differing options as being helpful and not a hindrance. Options. Work out what your options are. Encourage all crew members to express options and air their doubts or objections without fear of being made to look foolish. Decisions. Make the decisions. Always explain the reasons for a particular decision, and deal only with facts. Do not be inclusive but remember that any decision may be modified in the light of changing circumstances. Assign tasks. Allocate the tasks and share the workload. Review your decision. Keep reviewing the decision. Personalities. Most of the people you will deal with as a captain are hardworking professional people, whose overall aim is much the same as yours, to dispatch the aircraft safely and if humanly possible on time. Unfortunately, not everyone is as focused on assisting you in your aims. You will come across a few of the following, and possibly others as well one. First officers who think they would make a better captain than you. 2. Senior cabin crew who fail to communicate adequately with you, and probably also the rest of the crew and the passengers. 3. Engineers who aren't going to fix anything, it can be done on the night stop or refer immediately to the mail. 4. Dispatchers who are only interested in getting the flight to leave on time regardless of overriding factors how you deal with these and other problems you encounter daily is of course entirely. Up to you. You are the captain. Remember those definitions, 
it is up to you to sort out the problem. How you do this will obviously vary with the circumstances, your own personality, and the experience and personality of those who are involved. It will be worth your while to put some effort into general considerations along the following lines so that you are at least prepared. You will have heard it before, safety is the first priority. This is even more valid when you are the captain. Safety is your first priority, nobody else's. If a situation with a crew member cannot be resolved and an atmosphere or complete communication breakdown occurs action must be taken. 1. It is not acceptable to have two or more crew members on a public transport airplane who are actively not cooperating or communicating. 2. As a last resort you may have to consider offloading or replacing one or possibly more individuals to resolve the situation. 3. Finally, consider your approach to these individuals. You must be firm but fair in your dealings with your crew. Open communication and respect for their fears and feelings will go a long way to making you a captain that crews respect and enjoy working with. Simple things such as explaining what is happening when you have a tech delay will allay their worries, is it safe? Do remember most of the crew has little technical aviation background, but many are highly educated and want and need to understand what is going on. Apart from demonstrating that you care enough to explain what is happening, it widens their knowledge and increases their respect for you when they can see that you have a good understanding of the situation.